Welcome back to the last lecture of the semester. And we're not actually in chapter 11 anymore. We are instead going to talk about one single big topic out of chapter 12. Now, fluid dynamics, the topic of chapter 12, is a really interesting and engaging field of physics. But it's one that Physics 125, our course, uh, isn't really designed to get into details on. But the one big topic that we are going to talk about in this video, Bernoulli's equation, is really interesting and it has some pretty cool demonstrations that we normally do in class and we'll link to several videos um, in, this, in this lecture slides. So we normally go through a kind of hand wavy conceptual derivation so that we understand where Bernoulli's equation comes from. We don't really have um, the time to do anything in detail uh, and showing a derivation on the whiteboard that we're not really going to be able to follow doesn't seem like a good fit for this format. So I'm just going to jump to the punchline and kind of tell us that Bernoulli's equation, which is on the slide now, is really just a way of thinking about energy conservation. If we think about the three different terms, the pressure is kind of like a work added term because pressure is force per area, so applying a force um, is the same kind of thing as um, the work added term, which is force times distance. And so pressure is able to add energy to a system in, in a way that's kind of how we can think about it. Again, this is very hand wavy and we're not even doing the short derivation that we normally do. But the second term, if we look at it, it looks very similar to our kinetic energy term from chapter seven. But instead of mass, we now have density because we're talking about an overall fluid and different locations within a fluid might have different densities that still can carry kinetic energy ideas. And then the third one here, gravitational potential energy term from chapter seven looks really similar to, um, to this term. But again, instead of mass, we have rho for density because we're talking about different parts within a larger fluid. So the key idea here with Bernoulli's equation is that these three terms added together in one area of a fluid are going to balance those three terms added together in a different area of a fluid. So we'll see several different concepts um, in picture form in our slides and links to several different videos showing some of these concepts in action. But the key takeaway here is that we don't have a new quantitative problem type that we're really trying to solve. We just want to make sure we understand what this equation is able to tell us. So here's a question that I um, want us to think about. If we're watching fluid traveling through a pipe here, so let's imagine that this is a top-down view of a flat pipe. So the height's not um, changing, so we don't have to worry about that, um, that term. Where is going to have the greater fluid pressure? On the left side where the pipe is wide or on the right side where the pipe is small? Now again, we have the equation on the slide, so think about it for a second. Pause the video if you need to. Okay, when I ask this question in class, um, almost everybody picks location number two. So let's try this one again, okay? We can use this equation to help us. We need to make sure we understand that we're not ever trying to just guess. We are trying to use the tools that are available to us. So I've, I've put our situation very specifically now into the equation that we have on the slide, which means I've taken out the height term because I said that the height was constant, and we're comparing location one, that pair of terms, with location two, that pair of terms. So it's the same question, where is the pressure higher? But now I want you to think about where is the speed higher? That is one that I feel like we all have a better intuition for. If we think about where the fluid is moving faster, it is moving faster at location two. It is physically moving a lot faster because in order to have the same volume of fluid move through that thinner pipe, it has to go a longer distance because it has a smaller um, surface area. And on the left side, all of the fluid is moving slower because it has a bigger surface area, so that volume um, match is going to be a shorter distance traveled in that amount of time. So if the velocity is bigger in location two, which means that term, the kinetic energy type term, is bigger for location two, then for the left and right side to balance here, even without putting in numbers, the pressure actually has to be higher at location one. 
This is a really, really important takeaway for us. We often have this kind of misunderstanding of what we mean by fluid pressure because of different real life examples that we, we are picturing in our heads. But typically what we are imagining is not the like fluid pressure at a given location. So for example, a lot of students um, have uh, told me that what they think about the first time that they answer this is um, a garden hose. If you have a garden hose and you cover up part of the um, part of the opening, the water shoots out a lot faster, right? Especially anybody who's got younger siblings um, has probably done this in their lives. Um, it shoots out a lot faster, okay? And so we are picturing that somehow that means that that fluid pressure is larger. But what we've actually done is we've made the pressure difference behind our thumb compared to in front of our thumb really big. And it's the bigger pressure behind our thumb that is causing that stuff to speed up. And so when we think about the location of fluid pressure being high or low, we really do need to understand that it's not the same as when the fluid is moving fast or slow. Those are two completely separate terms. And when the heights are equal, and in a lot of the different examples that we're going to see in picture form and in linked videos, higher fluid speeds mean lower fluid pressure because the height is roughly constant. So for example, if we have a river um, that, that shortens, um, that gets narrower, then it's the same kind of thing like a pipe where the fluid is moving faster in the narrower part of the river, but the higher um, pressure is actually where things are slow. Higher speed means lower fluid pressure. That's one of the single biggest concept takeaways out of Bernoulli's equation. So it's worth writing down in big, bold, highlighted words if we need to in our slides, in our notes. Okay, so there's a whole lot of real world applications of this. This is figure 12.5 out of OpenStax College Physics. And so you're welcome to read through the, the details of the um, caption. I'm not gonna do that here, but there's a lot of sources of um, causing stuff to be pulled from one location to another because of a pressure difference caused by us speeding up a fluid. So from left to right, we um, kind of send quick air through a pipe and it basically pulls the natural gas from the higher pressure down below to the lower pressure where we have that air moving. A perfume atomizer, um, the squeeze bottle on one of those kind of um, uh, perfume atomizer, the fancy, the fancy old ones, the squeeze is just sending air sideways. It is just sending air sideways and that actually causes a low pressure at the top of the tube, pulling the perfume up from high pressure um, down below to low pressure above. The higher pressure is kind of pushing that perfume up. Uh, the water heater example here as well, all of these cases are the same overall structure. There's a force pushing an object from higher pressure into lower pressure, an object or a fluid. This also explains um, airplane wings. All of the big picture concepts of aerodynamics really do care about fluid dynamics. And that, um, that means Bernoulli's equation plays a big role here. The way that aircraft wings are specifically shaped means that air has to travel a bigger distance at the top, so it has to go faster to get from the left side of the picture to the right side of the picture. And so the faster speeds above the wing cause a low pressure, and the slower speeds below the wing cause a higher pressure. And so the pressure below is bigger than the pressure above, and there's a lift force. The airplane's engines are what cause it to go forward, but this um, pressure difference are, is what allows us to be able to fight against gravity in the up and down direction. Same thing with um, sailboats. Sailboats um, use the shape of their sails. Um, it's not just air blowing into the sails. That's really not how sailboats work if you've ever looked at them um, in person. Instead, they're using that shape of the sail to force air to go slower on one side of the sail and faster on the other 
so that there's this net overall push um, to it. So kind of interesting, and again, both of these are also in OpenStax College Physics. This is figure 12.6 if you're interested. A couple of other examples, this is from section 12.3 of the book, and there's even a full number worked problem that's outside the scope of our curriculum. Um, so we're not even going to present that material. But when we think about fire hydrants, anytime that they show up broken in TV shows or movies, the water is spewing out um, at extremely high pressure. Um, and the reason that water is kept at such high pressure in the hydrants is so that we can actually send it up several flights um, or several stories of a building so that firefighters can still have that um, water be moving quickly at a reasonable pressure to be able to put that fire out. So if you're interested in the, in the numbers involved there, um, definitely look at section 12.3 of the book, but keep in mind that it has a lot more complex math using this um, particular Bernoulli's equation than what we are actually going to do in this class. We're just thinking about the concept, but sometimes students benefit from seeing those numbers um, plugged in. And then water towers are another really um, interesting part of Bernoulli's equation where instead of thinking about the pressure and kinetic energy type term, we're thinking about pressure and the height term. So water towers are not just a nice place to put your city name and um, logo. They're actually built to have a large volume of water at low pressure that is easily available to become high pressure water in the system as soon as somebody turns on their tap or needs that water at high pressure. As the water tower depletes, we do have to pump it up. Um, we do have to force it to go up into the water tower but we wouldn't want to have to constantly be running that pump every time someone turned on their sink. So water towers make sure that there's a lot of easily accessible water at a height so that as the height drops, the pressure increases and the water can actually move through the pipes as needed. And if you've ever seen um, really tall buildings, especially downtown in cities, Tall buildings that are, are above the height of their area water tower often have their own rooftop um, water towers to pressurize their own water system. Because if they didn't, the people at the very top levels of this building, when they turned on the tap, the water would go from the water tower at really low pressure, at high pressure down through the ground, and then as it went up and up in the building, it would lose more and more pressure, and then you would get just a trickle of water unless you had to actively pump it every single time that somebody turned on the tap. So for the same reason that cities build water towers, buildings often build their own if they're a little bit too tall. Now the, the one disappointing thing about being um, online for this particular chapter is that we have some really fun demonstrations that we do in class because we have a um, really strong air hose um, capable of showing us a whole lot of these different examples. But I've um, looked briefly through YouTube and you might find your own examples as well for videos that are fairly short, that don't go into more detail than we need to, um, and that show pretty clearly the same kind of demonstrations that we would have in class. So these links are um, clickable in the posted slides. So I really do recommend that you um, that you watch these videos and you can certainly search YouTube for um, Bernoulli's principle um, and then ping pong ball or atomizer or whatever. Um, and you'll find other examples as well. Um, but I tried to pick ones that were kind of at the right level and the right length for us. Several of these are also um, actually pretty easy to try at home especially the bottom one. It says blowing um, between two pieces of paper, but the video actually has two um, balloons suspended from strings. So as you watch these, uh, you might decide that you and the other people that you're stuck with um, at, your, uh, at your place of residence um, might have fun with some of these examples, seeing physics happen um, in person. So I, I hope that you are able to get some of the kind of interesting, fun concept out of this, even though we don't have um, in-class examples to see this, this happen right in front of us. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out through Blackboard or emails. Um, and this is the last official video of the semester, so we better make it a pretty good ending. 
Alright, so this is something you can try at home with an air supply like a hair dryer and a ping pong ball. Now because you're not here with me, I'm using a piece of paper to show the airflow. The speed of the air is very fast on top of the ball and very slow below it. So on top of the ball, high speeds means low pressure. And below the ball, low speeds means high pressure. So there is a net force upwards from the high pressure below to the low pressure above. So what happens if I move the hair dryer? The ball actually follows along with that low pressure area, kind of like magic. But what's really happening is the net force is not just upwards. We aren't just pushing on the ball with the air. Instead, we're creating that pressure difference between the not moving air below, the high pressure, and the fast moving air above, the low pressure. And so the ball is kind of pushed into that low pressure area, which means it's pushed both up and a little bit to the side, into the airflow. And that's why it's able to follow along when we bring the airflow away from it. Almost like magic. So try this at home and have a wonderful day.